Good afternoon. I'm Aaron Poffenberger. This is a Road Warrior Disaster Recovery. A little bit about me. I'm a software developer by trade. I mostly work in uh, the area of InfoSec. I've written a lot of software that helps people uh, secure their systems by finding vulnerabilities, so it's more on the blue team side if you uh, work in that area. I've been an OpenBSD user since about 3.2, but I've used a lot of other Unix-like operating systems and non-Unix-like operating systems. And I consider myself something of a backup operator. A little bit about the talk. We're going to talk about um, recovery planning, uh, pre preparation, operation, actual recovery, how to handle uh, crossing international borders, and then some caveats about this system. So the motivation for this, I, I wrote a blog post a couple years ago about the time that I nuked the disk label. It was one of those easy to make mistakes. I had a system set up, a script, because we all write scripts, right? It would download the latest install.fs off of the OpenBSD website and then write it to a thumb drive for me. I knew I should not have hard-coded the uh, device in the script, but it was one of those things I knew that I would go back and fix. Well, I rebooted the computer, forgot that there was a SD card in the slot, which then moved all of the device numbers over. And so instead of writing this install.fs file to uh, a blank thumb drive, it started overwriting uh, my root partition. Now, anybody who's done this knows it only takes about two seconds to realize that you've made that mistake, and it also takes about two seconds, or really less, it just takes one or two bytes to really screw up the disk label. So I immediately hit control C, started hyperventilating, panicking, thinking, okay, hang on a second, I've got a backup at the house, I'm okay, and this is OpenBSD, the kernel's loaded into memory, everything's gonna be fine. I've got a copy of the disk label in var backup, because that's one of the things that the security script does every day, is it uh, dumps the disk label and writes it into this backup. I'm thinking everything's okay, until I saw the DDB uh, uh, prompt come up. I was like, uh-oh, I must have written deep enough in that I got into the swap space. And of course, that's what happened. So again, a little bit of panic, but I'm thinking, okay, I've got backups at the house. But then I realized that somebody had recently been playing with ZFS destroy minus R and had thoughtlessly destroyed a bunch of recent backups. So while I had backups from maybe three months ago, I didn't have last week or the week before, and so I, I knew I was in trouble. So I spent some, um, some quality time thinking and remembered scan FFS and remembered, okay, so all I gotta really do is find slash var, and then I can put the disk label back, and then I can find slash home. Because when it was all said and done, all I really cared about was slash home. Uh, a few hours later, I had um, put together the system. I found um, slash var, I found slash home, and I saved my own bacon, which made me think, you know, I really gotta tighten up on my backup system. Just because I've done a little bit here and there doesn't mean I can really deal with disaster. I certainly can't deal with myself and DD. So that was what started all of this. And then there's also the case that my laptop carries an immense amount of important data. This is where I do all my work. Uh, at least for my personal stuff. So the goals that I came up with for myself, and don't think that I sat down and scratched all this out. This is kind of a little bit of after the fact imputing goals, but you know, we've all been doing this long enough that these are probably about the same goals most of us would have if we were coming up with a backup system. I want it to be reliable, I want it to be fast, I want it to work while I'm on the go. Uh, I've gotta have easy access to be able to restore on the road. It's one thing to destroy your laptop when your backup server is in the next room. It's another thing to destroy your backup when you're at the, uh, or destroy your laptop when you're in a hotel and the Wi-Fi is doing this all day, right? Especially if you need SSH keys to get to the server, where are you going to get a copy of that? Of course, I wanted to make sure uh, my home drive was backed up and that I had whatever I needed to rebuild the system. And of course, I didn't want to compromise on security. The easy solution would be to just put some sort of an image on my website, um, somehow or another get the laptop up enough and then download it. But again, you've got the problem of keys and security. So what is a disaster? Well, we can debate that a little bit, but for my purposes, since this is my backup system, 
It's really any event that keeps me from using my laptop or accessing the data I need wherever I am. That's my definition of a disaster. Some of the disasters that we all face as travelers, uh, hardware failure, although for the most part, I don't personally run into those. Uh, theft, that's a very real possibility. Confiscation, if you're crossing uh, borders, uh, that's a real possibility. And then of course, user error, right? It's real easy to DD to the wrong device. So when thinking about disaster, and I think everybody should think about these same questions, is um, who am I in the world? My concerns, uh, I'm a software developer, we'll talk about who I am as we get to the end of this, but if you're a CEO or the CTO or the CFO or the controller, you have different concerns than maybe I have as a developer. If you're a journalist or some sort of an activist or a dissident, you have different concerns. So you need to be thinking to yourself, who am I? Why would someone be interested in my laptop? Now, as a developer, source code, uh, perhaps access codes. Maybe I have SSH keys uh, that would make um, that information very interesting. Perhaps I have customer data, even sanitized customer data. Uh, when I was doing a lot of active consulting, my goal in life with regard to uh, customer data was to never be the person in the news article that said, a consultant lost a laptop with a bunch of unencrypted data, right? You don't want to be that person. What access might I have? You might have admin or root. You might have uh, personal or employer banking details, social media, uh, VPN credentials. For those of you who remember the Target um, breach a few years ago, it was through an HVAC company, you know, heating and uh, AC and all that. They had VPN into Target systems. This is real common. I've run into this. When I've done consulting for small businesses. The, the HVAC people will oftentimes want to punch through and allow themselves to connect via RDP to the system because, of course, it runs Windows, right? And that's how they got into Target. You might have a, a commit bit to an interesting project. A lot of open source projects are very desirable and attractive as vectors for distributing malware, right? Because everybody's downloading free software off to the internet. Uh, so how is that hardware um, at risk? Well, obviously, again, thieves and fraudsters uh, somehow or another getting it. Competitors, uh, depending on for whom you work, there might be a competitor that's interested in your hardware or your data. Nation states, manufacturers, um, self, of course, you know, how many of us? I've never left my laptop on an airplane, but I've lost a few books that way and a really nice set of noise-canceling headphones. So here are the answers I came up for, my, for myself. I'm a developer, I mostly carry personal data, but I do have root access to all of my own servers, uh, my personal banking details, my social media accounts, and so I'm of most interest to thieves and fraudsters, although perhaps to some of my co company's competitors, uh, but maybe not, and then of course um, these. You know, again, it's gonna change. If you're the CEO of a large corporation and you're carrying your workaday laptop into certain nations, uh, you're just not thinking clearly about uh, the problems you deal with, because there are a lot of countries that will seize those laptops, even if just for a little while, or send someone into your hotel room. So think about these questions carefully. So after I um, thought through these questions, I had to come up with some preparation about how am I going to uh, deal with this. First step I, I took was hardening the, the system itself. I use a Lenovo laptop, as you can tell, it's a ThinkPad. I've been through the BIOS multiple times and I knew that there was a supervisor password available. Uh, a lot of laptops have um, bottom cover tamper evidence, so it'll beep at you if you've taken the bottom cover off. Recently I had to take the bottom cover off because I wanted to, I put in a new um, battery in the laptop. As soon as I booted, it started beeping at me to let me know that the back cover had been off. I put in the supervisor password, which on a lot of, uh, on most laptops that offer a supervisor password, it will allow you to do things like um, prevent people from changing uh, what the boot devices are that keeps people from sticking thumb drives into your computer. I, I will say though, I'm a little disappointed in Lenovo, the, the password for the BIOS isn't very complex. It's limited to uh, alphanumeric characters, all eight that you can think of. Not a very, a uh, strong password, but maybe it's strong enough to keep uh, someone from entering it while they've got your laptop in the hotel room. So once I'd taken care of that, 
Uh, the next step, of course, is full disk encryption. If you're not using full disk encryption, then uh, in terms of confiscation and theft or whatnot, your, um, your laptop's just an open secret. Uh, and nowadays, full disk encryption is cheap enough. Almost every processor on the market for any laptop produced, what, in the past seven, 10 years has uh, AE um, NI on it, so you're gonna get very fast performance. A lot of hard drives now have encryption built into them themselves. I'm personally still in that side of the camp that doesn't trust that, but it's another layer of protection. Uh, one of the other reasons, of course, um, uh, to approve of, you know, for your full disk encryption is it really reduces your anxiety about throwing out hard drives. Recently, I uh, helped my father clean out his house so that he could move into a smaller residence. And after we had pulled together all the hard drives, I had 30 plus hard drives to destroy. And I knew most of them weren't encrypted because he'd been buying hard drives and upgrading and replacing since the 90s. So I found a place that does hard drive shredding. And if for no other reason other than the entertainment factor, I would say take your hard drives and have them shredded. It's a beautiful thing to watch because the machines are, you know, it's kind of the Tim the Tool Man kind of event, uh, watching you know, big hardware destroying uh, solid things. Thermite Say again? Thermite yes, if you have access to Thermite, yeah, please do. And post a video when you're done, if you would. Excellent. So now I started looking at system hardening. That's, Obviously, some of these things are things that I'd already put into place a long time ago. I've, I've been using allow users or allow groups in my SSHD config for years. Uh, that time that I caught a, uh, I saw a log entry in syslog that indicated someone had figured out the root password on a server. I got really lucky on this. I just happened to be looking at the log and they hadn't taken advantage of it. But what they had done was a very slow um, below the radar attempt, about once every 10 minutes, they would try and connect as root and try a different password. And over the course of about a year, they eventually found a password that worked. So one, that told us uh, that that particular server had a uh, much too easy password. Two, root should never be allowed to log in. But three, you've also got the same problem with regular users, right? If, if someone's doing a, a low uh, impact um, test, you know, if they're constantly logging in as you, which might argue for not using your normal username as your remote um, user ID. But definitely use allow users or allow groups. One of the things that I talk about in my um, hardening my uh, mail servers talk is I also scan my logs. If I find that anybody has attempted to connect to any of my servers as root, I grab the IP and I put it into a block table. Nobody on earth should be attempting to connect to one of my servers as root. I'm not allowed to connect as root. So you connect with, um, you try to attach as root. I also do the same thing with my HTTPD logs. I look for all kinds of things. None of my servers run WP admin, for example. So you, if you try and pull WP admin and get an HTTP uh, 404 error, your IP address goes into my block list. I only, I purge the block list every 24 hours, but it does reduce the amount of, of uh, attacks. Now for the OpenBSD users, um, in, my, um, in my cron tab, I have, a, or actually this would work on FreeBSD as well, I'm thinking of something else. Uh, I, I run APM minus capital Z, which hibernates my laptop every morning at 4 a.m. And the reason for that is, is I know once a day, my laptop is going to shut itself down and somebody with the full disk encryption password is going to have to turn the laptop back on and unlock it. For me, that's not much of a burden because it's 4 a.m., I'm in bed, so the first thing I do when I get up uh, is I walk by the laptop, I turn it back on, I type in the password, I go make coffee. And it, it works out um, really well. That way I know if my laptop disappears, once a day, it's going to lock itself, and I'm not going to have to work, um, depend on X-lock keeping them out of the laptop. Now, one caveat, though, is if you're just using a simple cron tab job, that means all they have to do is sleep the laptop at that time of day. So what you need to do is have a Sentinel file on there that indicates whether the laptop has shut down in the past 24 hours, and cron should be checking that date and time. But 
um, it's something to consider. The other thing that I've added, uh, and it, I don't know if this is OpenBSD specific, but in OpenBSD, we have the hot plug daemon. Now, the hot plug daemon allows you to uh, uh, run a script when certain uh, devices are plugged in. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of these. It looks like your bog standard um, mouse dongle, right? This is actually a mouse jiggler. Does anybody remember the Dread Pirate Roberts and how the uh, federal government got his laptop in an unlocked and unencrypted way? So he's at a public library and he's sitting there doing his nefarious um, admin activities and they had a couple staged as if they were having a domestic dispute. And so when he looked away for a second, another person pushed his laptop so that it slid down the table to another person waiting with one of these. So my laptop is configured to do that when an HID uh, device is plugged in. Okay. So um, which raises, this is kind of a, a small um, discussion, why do we trust any HID device plugged into our computers? Now again, um, HID devices can do all kinds of things. Matter of fact, um, this device is uh, manifest as an HID device. This is called an only key. It um, types passwords. It, it actually has a teensy microcontroller on here. Uh, the firmware is um, uh, publicly available. If you go read the firmware, they've implemented enough of the HID that this um, functions as an HID device, much like your Yubi keys. The only difference between this and a Yubi key is this one has a uh, up to a 10-digit pin that you have to type in before the key will unlock. So if you want one of my, this is YubiKey compatible. So if you wanted to use my YubiKey password, you would first have to insert this into a computer, type my code, my pin code on here, which would then unlock it. And then I have 12 different buttons that I can push. It's six buttons, long or short press. It also has um, a hidden set that cannot be detected in any way, shape, or form. So you have repudiability. So you can unlock one set if someone were to ask you to, and it would give one set of passwords. And if you use a different pin code, it unlocks a different set of 12 passwords. I don't personally use the, um, the hidden set, so I can have 24 different passwords on this. It's just across two different pin codes. But the point is, besides the fact that this is really awesome, is that anything can be an HID device. So if you're allowing your computer to trust any HID device plugged into a USB port, you've opened a bit of vulnerability, and the mouse jiggler being uh, perhaps the simplest but the most awesome way of defeating screensavers, which again goes back to the point of why my computer shuts itself down using APM minus capital Z, which is to ensure that it fully locks itself once every uh, 24 hours. Again, a little bit of a nuisance, but it, um, it, it's something I'm willing to put up with. You may not be. So let's talk about disaster planning itself. There's two questions that should be asked, but most people focus on the first one. How do I recover from a disaster? And that's a very important question. If you're running a large business and you have a disaster, you know, think about you know, in the aftermath of September 11th. In addition to the, the uh, horrendous human disaster, there were a lot of businesses that discovered that their computing system, disaster recovery systems, were, in, um, were inadequate. And so a lot of us around the world began testing our DR plans to see, do they actually work? But the other question you should be asking yourself is, what happened to the data on those systems? It's all fine and dandy if a bit of thermite destroys your hard drive, uh, or a fire. Um, floods, not so much. I, I lived in, I've lived in Houston now for um, about 17 years. I've been associated with Houston for more than 20 years. We've gone through several um, water events where computers have been underwater. Hard drives are remarkably resilient to water, especially if there isn't a lot of pressure. If, if you're sitting in three feet of water, your hard drive will probably live through it. And if you've ever used drive savers, drive savers can recover an immense amount of data. One of my favorite stories of theirs from the 90s was a guy who lost a laptop 
uh, in a small plane off of the coast of one of the South American countries, paid divers to go down and fetch the laptop, which was then sent to drive savers who recovered all of his data. Now, one, that's very impressive, but two, that should be telling you that just because the server isn't useful to you doesn't mean that it's not useful to someone else with the right tools. So you've got to think about both of these questions. There's a third question, though, uh, that a lot of us as people should be asking ourselves. Most companies have resiliency built in. If uh, you know, We call it the bus count, right? You know, what's your company's bus count for server admins? Hopefully it's not one. And if you're not familiar with the bus count question, it's how many people can get hit by a bus crossing the street before you run out of server admins? So you really want three or four or 10 or 1,000, but a lot of families, like mine, the bus count for husbands is one. And so you need to be thinking about how do I make sure that my wife and family can get to this data? I can lock this system down so that very few people on Earth can get into it. But you know, I've got to make sure that my wife and children, so you've got to think about this a little bit like estate planning. How am I going to escrow my data in such a way that my family can get to it? The simplest way would be to make sure that your significant other and you know, those important people in your life have the relevant passwords, either a copy of your password manager and the master um, password, or you know, some way of getting back that data. Uh, so think about that as you're building your systems. Don't just think about the hackers because Hackers are, um, they're not after you or me per se. They, may, they might be after Colin, but they're not after me. Okay, so with the laptop and the OS hardened, I started looking at synchronizing and backups. So repeat after me, synchronization is not a backup strategy. It is not, uh, but it is still useful. Uh, there's a lot of really great tools out there for synchronization. Uh, I chose Unison. I like Unison for a couple of reasons. One, it's been around for a very long time. Benjamin Pierce and uh, his collaborators have been working on this for quite a while. It's written in OCaml. Uh, I, I was a Haskell developer for a while, so the code base is uh, transparent enough to me that I've been able to look at it, and I like what they're doing. Uh, but there's also sync thing. There's, um, you can use rsync if you want something really simple you know, for a one-way outbound. Um, but I chose Unison. I have a script in cron that runs every five minutes. Um, I wrote a little wrapper script for it. One of the things I will tell you about uh, Unison is you, if you're going to run it in a cron job, make sure you um, set up some sort of a mutex. You do not want two of these running at the same time because you'll wind up replicating Sentinel files all over the place. So right now, um, this script I wrote called usync, which um, will make it to my GitHub, is connecting to a server in Houston and attempting to connect. Wi-Fi must be acting up again. That's why I have it set on a cron job so that if it misses, it runs every five minutes. If it misses one particular five minute interval, it picks it up the next one. I could put in a, um, uh, a different system. Uh, Unison does allow you to uh, call it in response to file system events, but that usually requires um, a lot more coding than I was willing to go through. So, yeah, Wi-Fi is not working. Now, one of the ways that I solved the problem of connection, so Unison runs over SSH. It'll connect to your server via SSH. It's, um, it's very much like rsync in that it starts a daemon process on the far end, and then it talks the Unison protocol. And so it um, begins... Um, so what I needed to do was to find a way of getting past my firewall because the server sits on the other side of the firewall. So a couple of things is the uh, Unison connects as a very specific user with a very specific key that has been signed by a trusted user, CA key and SSH. If you haven't played with the, um, the CA keys feature in SSH, you're really missing out on something. It's a way of signing keys so that your, um, your firewall or whatever doesn't have to actually know about specific named users. So that way I can pop users all the way through, and it allows you to set expiries. So my Unison um, SSH key can only log, can only connect to, uh, it can pass through the firewall, go to a specific server, uh, log in as a specific user. In the SSHD config on that server, I have a directive that tells it, um, uh, actually I don't have it in here it tells it which process it can run. So it actually uses force command 
to run Unison in daemon mode. So it, it can only go to a particular um, box. And then that key only has a one-year lifetime. Now, for myself, as an interactive user, I sign my own keys with the same certificate, and my personal SSH key expires every 30 days. So I, I'm forced to re-sign my personal SSH key every 30 days, but for certain um, processes that are extremely limited, they get a longer time frame. And then SSH config uses uh, the SSH proxy jump to pass through the firewall. You ever heard of proxy jump? Anybody using proxy jump? Yeah. Oh, oh yes, Mr. Lucas, who wrote the book, <laughs> yes, uh, indeed has heard us. Now, you used to be able to do this in SSH, but recently, within the past couple years, they added one specific command that sets everything up for you. It's either proxy jump or minus capital J. So if I type SSH minus capital J, the name of a server and then my actual target, it will connect to the intermediary server first and then pop me through to the final server. That's what this should have been doing right here. It, um, it did not. So let's see. Fire, uh, oh, I know. I think I slept on my laptop. But it, that command right there would get me to one of my um, NAS servers, uh, SSH minus uh, capital J, FW. Now, you notice, of course, I'm using um, aliases there, so you don't actually know the name of that server. Uh, my SSH config has all of these built into it. The other thing you might consider um, with your SSH config is how do I know whether I'm inside or outside my firewall? So I wanted to make sure that my synchronization process was constantly working and constantly running. So I have, um, I, I do host checks in SSH config with match host. So what it will do here is this FW is an unpublished uh, name. So even for my domain, that will not resolve to anything whatsoever. But inside my firewall, it does resolve. And so it'll give a nice 10.10 .10 address. So I, I do match host um, FW. If host FW as an exec um, command fails, then it puts in the, uh, the public static IP address. Otherwise, it uses whatever um, is resolved from um, DNS. And I do the same thing for a couple of others. So I have another server called um, HomeNAS, which requires a proxy jump. And uh, so you spend some quality time with uh, the man page for SSH config and SSH D config, or read Mr. Lucas's book. I'd recommend both. OK, so that gets, um, so that's how I handle synchronization. You can do the same thing with sync thing. You can do the same thing with Unisong. You can do the same thing with rsync. The techniques all work. It's just a matter of pick your poison. Now, backups. Repeat after me. Re replication is not the same as an offline backup. Did anybody read the excruciatingly long wired article about the untold story of NotPetya? So Maersk. Uh, got uh, infected because they had an office in the Ukraine that uh, was infected when the Ukraine was infected with NotPetya. NotPetya rips through Windows uh, infrastructure like nothing you can imagine. And so within no time, it had worked its way through Maersk, and they started having servers going up and down. Um, Maersk did not have a single backup of their uh, Windows um, Active Directory anywhere on Earth. No backups. Why? They said, well, we have 150 domain controllers that are all replicated. Why would we need backups? If server A falls off the bus, who cares? We'll just replicate back. If A through Z fall off the bus, we'll uh, just replicate them back. They weren't expecting not Petya. And the only thing that saved their bacon was their office in Nigeria had really bad internet connectivity, was offline at the precise moment that NotPetya was ripping through their network. So the, the Nigerian admin calls and uh, he's trying to get connected and he says, I'm having problems. They said, are you offline? Do you have, is your Active Directory server still working? He said, yes. They said, shut it down now, take the hard disks out and fly them to London. <laughs> he says, well, I don't have a visa for London. He said, well, where can you fly? He says, well, I can get to Egypt. Egypt. He said, okay, we've got a guy in Egypt. So they literally sneaker netted this thing 
this one last hard drive left on Earth that had their entire Active Directory. Again, replication is not the same as an offline backup. So for remote backups, I use a couple of, of systems. So I, I R-sync to a server uh, back at my house. Um, that's just for simple backups. I don't R-sync the entire system. I only care about a few things. On OpenBSD, that's ETC, that's um, VAR, user source ports, and Zenocara, because I do um, some work in those trees, and then um, slash uh, home. Those are the only things I really care about. Everything else can be rebuilt if I have, uh, matter of fact, I really only care about slash home when it's all said and done. For on the go backups, I was using rsync. I was using a, a little hard drive. This is a, a handy little enclosure that I got. We had a, uh, a MacBook in the house that needed to be upgraded uh, with a larger SSD. So I bought this kit from a company called Transcend. It came with a larger SSD, and it came with this for your old one. It's a little NVMe holder. You can find dozens of NVMe holders um, on the internet. This one happens to be USB 3. You can get USB-C. Uh, the, the enclosures aren't expensive. Uh, a USB 3 enclosure will cost you about 15 bucks. A USB-C enclosure closer to about 35 bucks. You can get uh, NVMe drives. Um, I, I've seen 256 um, gigabyte down around $40 to $50. If you're near a micro center, the micro center Inland Premium brand is very well regarded and cheap. You can get a terabyte for 107 bucks in Houston. I'm assuming that's about the same price in the rest of uh, the United States. Uh, I would recommend getting at least a 512 because you get better write speeds. Uh, because of the number of chips on the, um, on the card. If you want maximum write speed, you gotta jump up to the two terabyte. So the 256 and below are the slowest. The um, 512 to one terabyte have really good um, average speeds, and then the two terabytes are the fastest. So um, I switched from rsync to dump for a couple of reasons. One, um, well, a couple of things. I repartitioned my hard drive Wednesday morning I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And um, put a separate encrypted partition all the way at the end of the hard drive. And I mount that at var dump. And so now I dump at uh, levels 0, 1, and 2 there, because now I can put that on a cron job. And that cron job can run all the time. Yes, I'm on OpenBSD. I don't have a snapshotting file system. So this is um, what, what I have available to me. But even for those of you who have snapshotting file systems, uh, that's still not the same as a backup. You need to get the data off um, the computer. So now, uh, so I have an APM, actually that should be a, a, a hot plug D script, not an APMD. I have a hot plug D script that runs. Every time a USB device is connected, it looks in the root for a file called dollar backup. If that file exists, it executes it and does whatever's in there. Uh, a little risky, a little bit dangerous, but uh, it's my drive, it's encrypted. Uh, I'm the only person who knows the password, so I'm reasonably confident that the, um, that the um, script is good. What the attach, uh, what the hot plug script does is it finds the password that's in uh, etc ssl slash private, uh, passes that through to bioctal, which then assembles it. It can then do a copy to the drive of whatever's on that last partition. So now I actually have a real honest to goodness offline backup that's not connected anywhere on earth. I carry it with me. It's also encrypted, but I have one immediately on the hard drive that I can get to in case I do a fat finger and, and destroy a file that I wanted in the moment. And then I've got the backup uh, back at my house in Houston. So why dump? Well, there's a couple of reasons. R-Sync can be kind of twisted into doing incremental updates, but um, I, I, it was much too slow. And it's built into dump. It just knows how to do it. Just, you, know, dash, you just tell it what you want. I want a dash zero, I want a dash two, I want a dash three, whatever. And it looks in Etsy dump dates and figures out what it needs to do. Plus, it's really easy to uh, restore entire file systems. Uh, it does mean, though, if you're doing multi-level dumps, you have to, uh, your restore process is the inverse, um, you know, the same number of, of dumps. So if you're at dump level nine, please don't do this to yourself. You would have to go through 10 levels of restore. But I usually go up through dump minus two. Okay. A um, little bit about security. The fact that I am storing passwords in Etsy SSL private I don't worry about it too much because mostly I figure if someone's on my computer 
and they can find those files, I've got much bigger problems than the fact that they happen to know the, the password to this particular drive but each person has to make their own decisions on that. But I wanted a fully automated system that I don't have to think about. So what about recovery? Well, I will tell you recovery requires some preparation, which is what the past um, 30 odd slides have been about. It can be done without preparation. If you read my blog post on the time that I nuked the disk label, it can be done if you're lucky. It requires luck. Don't trust luck, uh, be prepared. My process is pretty simple. I carry an OpenBSD install um, disk um, on, on a thumb drive. I don't really need this, uh, especially if I'm at a conference like this. I could ask any one of you to pull down install.fs and burn it to my thumb drive for me, but it's easier if I don't have to go around at 3 a.m. banging on hotel doors asking for help. And then, um, so I can uh, put a basic OS on there and then use restore. I do happen to know the password for this drive. Uh, th this drive does have a little bit more on it than a normal install.fs. I've written a script that takes install.fs, pops it open, and puts extra goodies in there, um, including a answer file for auto install, so I can just plug it in, reboot, and it'll rip through and rebuild um, mostly everything that I need. Um, the only thing I haven't added yet is, so as part of my dump process, I do drop, uh, I do dump the disk label for SD0, because if I were to do something incredibly um, stupid like DD, um, IF equals, you know, dev u random to uh, OF equals dev SD0, it would write over the disk label and the dump partition at the very bottom, I wouldn't know where it starts. So I need a copy of that disk label. I've still got this, but it's faster to read and write from the internal drive than it is the external, so that would make it a little bit faster for me. Although recently I remembered that this particular laptop, the T450S, has a second NVMe slot in it. And I was like, ooh, that's nice, because now I can buy another NVMe drive, put it in there. So as long as I don't DD over both drives, I would have a, a second place to get my data. Uh, so the steps are pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go through them, uh, but it really, uh, the full restore takes more than 10 minutes, but getting OpenBSD and getting this laptop into basic working condition is um, uh, very fast and simple. Does it work? Sure. Uh, a couple of months ago, I needed to go to Tulsa to visit some family. I grabbed a laptop that only had Windows on it and brought just my restore media. Uh, I planned to be there for a week, so I knew that if I messed this up, I was going to be a week with just a Windows laptop, and that's not a week I was looking forward to. And I came back uh, with a fully functioning laptop. Does it work in a pinch? Well, yes. So I, I tweeted this out on Tuesday night. My flight was Wednesday morning, uh, or Wednesday afternoon at 2.45. This literally did happen. It was not intentional. This tweet was not a full boast. It was a boast in the sense of, yeah, I did this and I can recover from it, but I, did, I, I had wanted to do this as a test. I was gonna do the repartitioning, but I thought, now nah, I'll wait till I get back from VBSDCon. Did it work? Sure. I uh, reinstalled the OS, went to bed, because it was close to 10 o'clock, got up, had breakfast, and starting around 8.30, I began the restore process and uh, had everything done, and this um, laptop that I'm presenting on is the one that I nuked uh, that night, so uh, it, it does work. A couple of comments on crossing international borders. They do pose special consideration uh, cases. Uh, if you're flying to the UK, they have uh, really, uh, they have laws that require you to reveal passwords. I don't know how uh, deep that goes. If, if you can literally honestly say, I don't know the password, is that a get out of jail free card? I don't know. But you, uh, but you do need to think about that when you're traveling. Lots of other countries do have um, laws that are similar to this. And then there's any number of laws that will just, uh, come, countries that will just take your laptop from you, walk into a back room for an hour or two, and bring it back and say, here. Um, so you might want to think about that. So how do we travel safely? In my particular system, I would really have no worries whatsoever over international waters um, DDing everything. Now, that doesn't save me, though, because there's a password on here. I'd have to DD everything, so that's maybe not the most practical. If I knew I was flying to the UK, I would go through some different thinking. 
do I need to carry everything on this laptop? If I was going to present a paper in the UK, do I really need to carry um, you know, copies of um, tax documents and stuff like that? Probably not. So I would probably slim my laptop down considerably and just make sure that there's nothing interesting on it. I would probably leave anything interesting that I thought I might need accessible from a website here in the US. Again, I don't know how far they can push you to reveal information. Could they force me to call my wife and ask her for, say, my Twitter password? I don't know my Twitter password. It's in a password manager. Uh, I have no idea. But I, um, so those are some of the things I would think about. The last um, possibility would be to carry a laptop that functions as little more than a dumb terminal uh, that has very little on it. So how could you get started with this? Well, the first thing I would say is just start backing up. Uh, I won't make you answer this question because I can't, but uh, how many people can honestly say that if your laptop was taken to, away from you right now, could go home and restore it sufficiently uh, that you wouldn't lose anything? Okay. A little more than, than half. That, that, that's quite good. Uh, that's uh, more than I was expecting. Um, start using dump, rsync, sync thing, tar snap. Yeah, I knew Colin would have his hand up on this. I mean, if I remember the story of Tarsnap, it was approximately a similar uh, thing. He knew he wanted to back up while he was away from you know, the home ship and started writing Tarsnap as a result of that. Right. Right. And so Colin's answer was, he knew he wanted backups that would actually happen, which is exactly what I ran into, because my original system was, I had to plug this thing in, in order to initiate the backup, which is why I went with the system. Well, I still had the R-Sync going on, but I wanted uh, backups with me as well. A couple of caveats, Te test your backups. Uh, you know, this is kind of a trivial point, but it's amazing how many times uh, when we're functioning with our systems administrator hat on that we wait until disaster to actually test things. Uh, you know, again, after September 11th, a lot of companies started asking their systems administrators, have you tested this? Do you know we can recover from uh, a, you know, what if the whole building evaporated? What would we do to bring the business back online? It, it takes practice to develop the confidence necessary to trust your backup system. This is one of the things, uh, when I was in the Army, we were, um, I was at jump school, and it was one of the days that the black hats were haranguing us, which is normal for black hats. And these aren't the black hats that, you not, you know, that we all know as InfoSec people. These are people who literally wear black hats, and they were haranguing us for our sloth and other things. But one of the things that they said that stuck with me now for many years is, Every piece of safety equipment that you're wearing is the result of somebody dying. I'm thinking, oh, well, that changes my perspective. This equipment's heavy. Um, without your rucksack or anything else, just wearing parachute and um, reserve and all that, you're in for about 35 to 40 pounds of stuff. And then you hook on you know, your M16 and your um, backpack and all, or your rucksack and all that stuff. You can be carrying around 75, 80 pounds or more uh, when you're trying to get there. So it, it changed my perspective on all this equipment that I'm carrying and wearing. And it stuck with me through all the years is that if you work with your equipment, learn how it works, you, you develop trust. And so I would, I would definitely recommend practice this. Get a separate laptop or a VM and practice nuking the entire thing and building it back. I have multiple backups. This isn't the only copy I carry with me, and of course, as, as you've heard, multiple points so far. I have copies uh, at home. I also have some cloud copies of the most critical data, the stuff I would absolutely hate to lose. Again, tax records. So where's the code? I'm working on publishing it. Uh, I apologize for being slow, but some of this code does things, and I don't want other people trusting it until uh, I'm 100% confident. You know, again, you know, we were talking about Unison. If you get those, uh, you know, without the mutexes, you go slapping Unison into a cron tab, you will wreck your data. Uh, it, it's a mess to clean up, and I know from experience. But you know, watch my blog. Um, I'll be posting stuff. I, actually, the, the usync script I'm feeling very good about and a couple of others, so they'll start going up online where you can look at them. Okay. Any questions? Anything I can answer about my system, backups in general? Uh, thoughts? 
Ja, Colin. Correct. Right. Yeah. Well, I actually I have some some um, solutions to that. So one of the things I make sure is that there is a, a rule in my pf um, dot conf that always allows the IP address from my house and a couple of other servers. So I do, I, I've, I have done that to myself as well. And as part of my mail system, people wonder, well, isn't that going to keep legitimate mail senders from sending to you? But in my other talk, I, I have um, copious and extensive whitelists for known good actors like Gmail. So even if someone were to tr connect as root uh, to my server, I wouldn't let them connect to SSH anymore, but they can still get to say port 25. But that is an excellent comment. You gotta, whenever you set up these kinds of systems, you have to think about what are the failure conditions that would lock me out. So thank you for that. Other questions, comments? Yes, in the back, Toby. Right. Uh, that's not easy at the moment. So what I have to do is um, log in first, um, go to shell, build the, uh, the crypto containers first. Then when you run um, install, there is an option for um, telling it to do an auto install and where to find the file, right? But uh, auto install will allow you to have an answer um, question that includes passwords that are already encrypted uh, correctly. So as far as I know, there is nothing in the works at the moment to build a, a full disk encryption system entirely from auto install. Excellent question. Yes, sir. Right, so I, I've, for, for my family, most of them run Mac OS. I'm not going to force the family to use OpenBSD. If any of them wanted to use OpenBSD, I would be happy to, and I have installed it into VMs for the kids, and I've been teaching them how to use it, but I, we're not at that point. And so for them, we also have iCloud. And that's why I said some of the most critical data I have does exist in the cloud. That's one of my backup plans for my wife, is so that if something happens to me, she's got access to iCloud and she can get access to that data. Because again, my goal isn't to keep everybody on earth out, but to keep most of the bad actors out and still somehow or another make sure my family can get to this stuff. Because I think it's more likely uh, that I, I will live to whatever you know, my expiry date is without major incident, and so I need to make sure they're covered. But it's an, it is an excellent question, because family, um, that, that is one of the hard ones. For those of you who have um, ZFS on your um, laptops, uh, because you run either FreeBSD or one of the Linuxes, you at least have ZFS send and receive, which is, um, it's not quite a full backup, because you don't have an offline system, but it's pretty good. And so you can be using that, but you'd still have to go through some of the steps I went through to make it easy and so that it can be automated from cron so that you know that it is happening when you're not um, aware of it. Yes, sir. Uh, just a follow-up. I've done that a couple of times. Um, problem is I'm starting to keep laptops for incredibly long periods of time. This laptop's now at four years. Uh, we, we have MacBooks in the house that are 10 years old now. And the only thing that I've changed is I've made sure I maxed the RAM and put SSDs in them. Uh, so it, we're really getting to the point in history where uh, the computer buying side, so I wouldn't wait until I was gonna get a new laptop. And now that um, FreeBSD and OpenBSD have excellent hypervisors, testing this stuff is a lot easier. Matter of fact, one of the things that I did for some testing just recently uh, as I started using VN config and creating little um, files on disk to test uh, attaching and detaching. So I have a, um, so in OpenBSD, the way you uh, mount a full disk encryption um, partition is you have to run bioctal, minus C, capital C, minus L, path to partition, um, soft raid zero, then it prompts you for a password, then you type it in, then you type mount um, con container, partition to whatever. I wrote a script that automates that whole thing because and I call it, not um, surprisingly, mount underscore soft raid. 
And that's the script that goes and looks in Etsy SSL private. It looks for the DUID um, as a file name and assumes that whatever's in there is supposed to be the password. And that's one of those other scripts that I'm feeling confident enough that I'm, uh, I'm about ready to post. Got a little bit more testing to do on it. And I also have a companion to that called U-mount soft raid, which unmounts it, deletes the directory if you want it to, and deletes the, um, uh, the device so that uh, I can plug this in. That hot plug script can do all of its dirty work, and when it's done, I know I can safely unplug this, because one of the, the nice features about this is it does have an LED. So I can more or less tell when it's quiescent and safely unplug it. Any other questions? We're a little bit over, so I don't want to keep you all, but I'm more than happy to talk about this and tell you more. Uh, I will be publishing more of this as we go. This isn't a, a one-time go because I'm still building out the system, so there will be more details in the coming months. Well, thank you very much. And again, thank you to Verizon, or VeriSign. Oh. Oh, the slides will be, are we going to post them on EasyChair? Yes. So the slides will be on EasyChair. There's a bunch of, um, so we've got contact details. There's a lot of links in here. You can't tell by telling what's a link. Um, but in the further reading and in the technology and resources, these are live links that go to places. So click on them if you don't already know where they take you to. Again, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Which one? Oh, which one? That one? Yeah. Oh, if you want to find me, I'm AK Poff everywhere I want to be found. So, again, thank you to our sponsors. Um, thank you to VeriSign, and thank you to Dan and uh, Mark and all of their helpers. This has been a great conference.